Yes. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we'll start in about a minute if you guys can get a seat and uh, get comfortable, and then we'll get started. Thank you.
to learn and to understand what they're facing if my platform does not talk. We want to say mahalo to our county officials and all the experts from the volcano that have come to be with us and help us to understand and answer questions. So Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit be with us. Open our ears, open our hearts, and receive all this information and leave knowing, knowing something more than we didn't know. And pass the word over to all those who are not here tonight. Thank you, and thanks for joining us tonight. I am Thomas Bagno, I'm the Civil Defense Administrator for Hawaii County. And tonight, what we hope to accomplish is we'll have HBO, Hawaiian Volcano Observatory, present the update for Mauna Loa and the science behind it to help you understand what's going on. Then we go into the county's operations and our plan, what we've been putting together. Hope to share with you, hope to share with you um, what we have planned for the communities. And then we want to give you guys the tools for what you can do, for what you can prepare, and that information. And so we hope we move to that progression this evening. And then we'll end up with questions and answers. Um, second half of tonight's meeting. So when we get to that point, I'll give you instructions how we're going to do that. So at this point, I'll turn it over to scientists in charge, Ken Hong. Let's see, okay, that one works. Great. So, um, Thank you all for coming out. I'm Ken Han. I'm the scientist in charge of the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. And tonight uh, we have Frank Truesdale, who will be speaking on Mauna Loa. Frank has dedicated his career pretty much to understanding Mauna Loa and done most of the background work that allows us to understand the volcano and a lot of its prior behavior. So Frank will fill you in on you know, what he knows from looking at the volcano and then what we know from uh, recent activity on the volcano, what's going on, and what are the most likely things to happen and how they'll unfold. Uh, we also have several other people here. We have Katie Mulliken, somewhere, uh, Liz Gallant, Katie's over there, Liz Gallant, uh, Carolyn Porchetta, Frank is right there, and then uh, Dave Phillips, the deputy scientist in charge, is back in the corner. We'll all be around afterwards to answer your questions, so we'll stay as long as people have questions. So you're welcome to come up. And so Frank will present on uh, Mauna Loa activity, and then I'm going to follow him with a presentation on earthquakes, because I hear you guys have had an earthquake or two here recently and might want to know something about what that portends for the future and how it might be related to Mauna Loa as well. So I'm going to turn it over to Frank now. Thank you very much. Okay, welcome. Uh, one other person that's here from US Geological Survey is Mike Zoller. And after we're done, you can see we have these posters around. We're gonna have people stationed there. Please come up and ask any questions that you may have regarding what the activity is or on Mauna Loa or about the posters themselves. Okay, so I'm going to present background information on Mauna Loa. And the outline today is we're going to have some background info about the historical past, the monitoring information, how the activity now compares to activity from the two prior highly instrumented, I shouldn't say highly, instrumented eruptions from Mauna Loa, and then the current status. Okay, moving into the background. 
Mauna Loa has erupted 33 times in the historical period. And the historical period is that period from when the missionaries arrived and started to write down the information. Of course, the Hawaiians got here hundreds of years before that, or few, many centuries before that. And they had a tradition, their tradition is oral, not as quite as precise as Western people writing it down. But anyway, there's been 33 uh, eruptions in that period since 1832. Half of the eruptions start in the summit area and stay in the summit. So this is the summit of the volcano. Half of the eruptions start there and stay there. All Mauna Loa eruptions in this period have started with the summit phase first. About 25% of the eruptions proceeded into the Northeast Drift Zone. Summit phase first, then Northeast Drift Zone becomes the center of the eruptive activity. About 20% of the eruptions propagated into the Southwest Drift Zone. Summit phase first, followed by intrusion into the Southwest Drift Zone. Three radial vent eruptions. Those are the trump cards for volcanic hazards on Mauna Loa. They happen only on the north and west sides of the flank of the volcano. In 1859, a fissure broke out at 11,000 feet on the northwest flank, and then the lava flows went all the way down to the ocean north of Kiholo. <coughs> the Aha phase arrived there in eight days. In 1877 was a submarine radial vent in Kealakekua Bay. As I said, all eruptions started with a summit phase. There was a summit phase first. And then we had the 1859 flow. There was a summit phase first. Then we had the 1877. Had a summit eruption and then a submarine eruption with no lava produced in the intervening area. The special thing about these radial vents is that they can happen from below sea level all the way to the summit of the volcano. And then that influences your response time. Okay, after you're mapping the volcano, we want to make some derivative products that could be useful for the public. On the left side here is what we call a lava transit map. How quickly the lava flows move down the slopes and get to areas and where people live. So let's start with the extreme case. Down in South Kona, we had lava flows reach the ocean in a matter of hours. You can see the numbers here are the hours. We also have these posters around. If you can't see them, please go and check them out. Because this area has high productivity and steep slopes, the flows get down into where people live rapidly. So you have, basically, hours to respond. Let's take the opposite, the blue area, towards Hilo. We've had one historical flow enter into the middle part of what we know now as Hilo. That lava flow took over 280 days to get there. The productivity of this area is about half of what the daily productivity is for the Southwest Rift Zone. The other thing in working in the favor for the Hilo area is that the, there's steep slopes coming off the flank of the volcano from the Rift Zone. And those of you who have been on the Island Transit uh, Saddle Road, when you get up there, there's a big flat area. And then as you go towards Hilo, it gets steeper again. Well, that flat area in the middle causes the flows from the northeast rift zone on the north side to slow down, and they start to spread out. And the tendency then is for, even though there's voluminous lava produced at the vents, they have first flows go, stall in the flat topography, and then it jumps out and makes a second flow and a third flow, and it's sort of a divide and conquer. The other two areas we got here is yellow, which is this side of the volcano. And the flows that come off of the rift zone, the response time is typically days to weeks. 
depends on where you live. And then the other side is the radial vent domain. And that area is orange because then you have days to weeks to respond to that area. So if the flows start way up high, and the example is in 1859, flows made it down there in eight days. If the vent breaks out halfway down the slope, then that time to respond is now cut. The other map on the right are what we refer to as lava inundation maps. And these maps are to be used by not only emergency managers, but you as the general public. And the way that we envision you using the map is you identify where you live on this area. So let's say you live down here, and that's Nalehu. You're in this sort of orange color. Lava flows that can come through your house can only be originate from that segment of the rift zone. So if the lava flows are way high on the flank as we report them, for right now, you can maybe take it easy, but you should be prepared to move the, the dike propagates down now into your region. We have examples of these maps, big ones, in the back over there for you guys to go and look, see. Right? So now you know how quickly lava flows can transit your area. You can uh, look and see what part of the rift zone can impact you. You can make a plan. Okay, let's look at monitoring. This is a map of Mauna Loa with all these different symbols, and the symbols show you all the different kinds of monitoring that we have. I don't expect you to look at all the dots and see what they are, but the volcano has a lot of dots. It's well monitored. That's the point. Okay, now let's look at the historical uh, record that led up to seismicity that led up to 1975 and 1984 eruptions. So we have the time in the bottom here, and we're looking at earthquakes. These are the number of earthquakes that occurred. Shallow is this color, intermediate, and deep. Leading up to 1974, you see a ramp up in seismicity, both in the shallow and the deep. Right as the eruption's ready to unfold, the rate steeply increases. In 1984, the same kind of thing. We had a ramping up of earthquakes, and just before the eruption, you can see a great intense swarm of seismic activity. Now let's look in perspective between those eruptions and what we have now. We're looking at earthquake counts per month. This is prior to the 74 eruption. You can see there's a buildup of earthquakes, and during the eruption, high numbers of earthquakes. Prior to 84, you can see the ramping up was over a more extended period of time. And now we're over here, and you look at these in that context, and you say, holy smokes, the volcano's gonna blow up. The deal is, what we have now is we have more instruments on the volcano, we have better instruments, and the sensitivity of those instruments basically means that we can sense a lot more earthquakes than we did with the old equipment that we had in the past. So I'll show some plots how we compare the past activity to the current activity, trying to compare apples to apples instead of apples to oranges right here. The bottom plot is also looking at seismicity and you can see we had some ambient level and then started to climb more rapidly in the recent period of time. Here's a plot showing the most recent activity and we're comparing GPS and tilt and earthquakes. The top one is GPS and it's showing a line that we measure across the summit called Dara. And we measure that line and when that line extends due to the influx of molten material underneath. So the expansion or the lengthening of that line is indicative to the influx of magma or 
the magma accumulating beneath the surface. So the GPS shows us gradual, and we started to look over here in September and note that change. This is a tilt meter, and the tilt meter also during that period of time started to show. Now, the GPS can show magma at greater depths than the tilt meter. The tilt meter is more sensitive to stuff shallow. So both of these, the trend is the volcanoes inflate. And that's just to put it in the context of the earthquakes. The earthquakes also started to go up. And then we had this shallow inflation. And then we had this earthquake. And now you can see the numbers are starting to go down. The earthquake counts are going down. Looking at this in map view, in map view we're looking at the earthquakes. Now, in order to compare apples to apples, we actually take the magnitude and cut off the smallest number of events because the instruments now are more sensitive. In order to equalize the playing field, we gotta use a magnitude cutoff. Our old instruments were good at recording 1.7 and above. So I filtered the now data to 1.7 and above. And you can see we start with some deep earthquakes shown in the red, and we have shallow earthquakes in green. The summit caldera is under the green. And you can see with the better instruments, even with the filtering, we still recording more events now. Okay, moving on. So what's the big deal? What was all the heightened uh, awareness. Well, just over three weeks ago, we had a flurry of earthquakes that made us say, hey, the volcano's doing something above these background levels and we should start paying attention more. And so we decided that we would go out and let you all know that the volcano's showing a little bit more activity than what we've seen in the past, the period just before. The so we're watching, but we also want to be transparent and let you know that we're watching, but the volcano was also doing something slightly different. Okay, now I'm looking at the same cutoff of earthquakes at 1.7, and we're looking at just prior to the eruption in July of the, uh, the uh, 1975 eruption. And then we're just looking at, so this is two weeks prior to the eruption, we're looking at the number of earthquakes underneath the summit. So just prior to July, we had 35 events. Prior to the 84 event, we had 26 events. In October 4th, we had 130 events. That's when we kind of went out and said, hey, something's going on. And now we have, after the earthquake that occurred down here, we had 61 events. So we kind of went to a peak, and now we're kind of dropping off. Now to kind of look at the data in terms of earthquakes that break rock and signify maybe the magma's on the move, we go to a slightly higher magnitude earthquakes, and we look at it in the context of the prior eruptions. Prior to the 75 eruption, 22 earthquakes of larger magnitude. Prior to 84, we had 11. Just at the peak, we had only 12. And right now, post the earthquake that you guys all felt, most likely, if you weren't working in Kona or somewhere else, uh, we've only had nine. Okay, so, now we're just kind of going through and looking at it again. This is looking at data for what's happening right now with a cutoff of 1.7, looking at six months prior to. So you can see it's building up and now it's kind of tapered off. In 84, it sort of went, you know, it, we had a few events and then finally towards the end, it spurted up and we had an eruption. And in 1975, which was more unusual, we had hundreds to thousands of earthquakes per day prior to that event. 
earthquakes only tell us one part of the story. The other part of the story that we rely heavily on is what we call deformation. How the ground changes its shape with the influx of magma into the reservoir. So in the old days, the initial way, now we have GPS. In the old days, we used to use laser ranging device. We'd shoot a laser across the caldera and measure the travel time, and based on that, we would get a distance. So the blue line here represents us using the laser ranging device across the caldera at these two points. So this technology came in line online just prior to the 74 event. You can see we got a couple readings and you can see inflation occurring and then the event happened. And between the 75 and 84 eruption, we also had extension across the caldera. And then as the eruption happens, the line really goes crazy because the dike cuts across the caldera floor and wedges the two <coughs> points apart. And that's why you get these big peaks. We continued with this measurements up until the uh, late 90s. And then we started measuring with GPS. And GPS in the old days was what we call <coughs> incremental. Because that was a new technology, they put the satellites up in the air, and you would go and set up your instrument. And because they didn't have a full constellation of satellites in the sky, you had to wait till the satellites were over your part of the Earth and then you could set up your receiver and get some measurements and then they would rotate out of view and then they would come back out. And then eventually they got enough of them up in the air where we could get continuous measurements. So you can see Mauna Loa's after the 84 eruption built up and then went quiet for a while. And then we had another pulse where it went up in the early 2000s. Okay, then GPS came online. And now we have these line lengths, and we continue that up until about 2015. Now we'll look at data in respective earthquake counts with the GPS data across the summit caldera. So you can see the number of earthquakes, the extension of the line, we get an eruption. We get an extension of the line, then we have an eruption. And then we continue on, and now we have extension of that line, and we have seismicity, and we're being vigilant. Okay, another way to look at this for more recent data is we're looking at the distance between these two points, just like the blue ones in the prior map, and this is looking at data in the last two years. So we had an intrusion and then a contraction in 20. 21. And now we're in this period of time where we're having an extension across this line, which is reflective of the magma coming into the volcano. We also can measure the vertical change at this station, and we see for a while, during the same period of time, this station was relatively flat, and only recently has that station been moving upward. So that means the magma has translated from depth to getting shallower. Okay, if we take all of the GPS instruments that I showed on the monitoring network for Mauna Loa and show you their motion, at the base of the arrow is a GPS station. And these are vectors to show in what direction those stations are moving. A radial pattern like this is suggestive of the magma reservoir at depth filling up with lava and pushing on the flank so all the stations are moving out kind of equal distance, on both sides at least. Now to put this in context, this is what the GPS vectors on Kilauea, which is a more active volcano, looks like. So you can see the magnitudes of movements on Kilauea are much greater 
we expect to see a lot more motion on Mauna Loa prior to the outbreak. The other technology we have available to us is satellite technology that goes around and it images the ground. And we can, between subsequent passes, look at the change in elevation. And the pass between uh, this period of time, I don't have the time on here, but it's basically the last six months, is showing about 1.5 centimeters of changes for each fringe. So there's been about six centimeters of vertical change on the volcano. And the butterfly wing pattern like that is informative for what is inflating. So when you have a butterfly pattern, it's a dike. A dike is a long linear feature that's very tall, very long, about a meter wide, and it's filling up with lava, and you get this kind of pattern. If you only had a bullseye pattern, then it would be a simple balloon that's inflating. But since we have a butterfly-like wing pattern, it's a dike. Okay, so what are we missing to forecast an impending eruption? Well, we expect to see more consistent and persistent seismicity. Instead of now, the earthquakes have kind of rolled off, we expect that to just keep climbing and climbing and climbing. We also expect to see the rates of deformation, increasing rates of seismic activity and the extension across the volcano to go increasing. So what's happening? We have small inflation and we have seismicity above background. The important point is that we're monitoring, we're being vigilant. What else is HVO doing? Well, we're up here upgrading our networks, improving them, we're upgrading gas sensors, we're adding additional GPS coverage, we're talking with our emergency response partners. We have internal planning. We're coordinating with our partners. We're briefing individuals. We're coming out to the community to make sure that you guys are all informed. So the take home message is you should stay aware. You should be aware of the hazards. Stay informed, and because the volcano is swelling, an eruption is not imminent, not at this point in time. Okay, so I'm turning it over to Ken to speak about the hollow earthquakes. Thank you, Frank. Um, so, before I start on earthquakes, I just want to clarify a few things. We use a system called the Volcano Alert Level that was designed, it's kind of something that's used more or less worldwide, but we have four stages, they're called Normal, Advisory, Watch, and Warning. Okay, right now we're in an advisory, so, you know, you're advised to be uh, paying attention. Right, and uh, this advisory status, it also goes along with an aircraft aviation set of colors. So normal would be green, advisory is yellow, watch is orange, and uh, warning is red. And we know here that everybody in this room is gonna forget those words, but generally knows that if the volcano is red, it must not be good, right? And if the volcano is orange, it's not quite as bad as red, but there's something going on. And if it's yellow, something maybe is happening. So what we have done is we make sure um, that we keep those words and the colors together. So normal and green will always stay together. We'll never decouple them. We'll never decouple yellow from advisory or orange from watch or red from warning. Okay. 
So when we do this kind of, um, of put out a warning, like the next step would be we're right now in yellow advisory because we've got this, this you know, heightened unrest is what we're calling it. Uh, basically, we know that there's magma coming into Mauna Loa. We know it's causing earthquakes and deformation. And so what I want to tell you, though, is what the limits of we, what we can actually do with these warnings and what we can tell you, okay? Because uh, a couple weeks ago, there was some stuff that's passed around. And in every eruption, there's stuff that's passed around about, oh, the USGS said there's going to be an eruption. And a couple of weeks ago, they got really specific. They said there's going to be an eruption. It's going to go down the southwest rift zone, and it's going to cut the road between Pahala and Nalaita. So there, that was really specific. And I would love to be able to tell you that two weeks in advance, exactly how that's going to happen. And so would all of us at the observatory, but we can't with the technology that we have. What we can do is tell you when we think, as Frank said, all these eruptions start with a summit eruption. So the first forecast that will go orange will be we're expecting an imminent summit eruption, right? It may or may not come, but we'll be seeing a lot of signals and things will really crank up compared to where we are now if we go to orange. We're saying that a summit eruption is imminent. The next thing that will happen is a summit eruption starts. So we'll issue a warning there. As soon as we see which way the lava, if it's going down a rift zone, we'll issue another warning that it's going down the southwest rift zone or the northeast rift zone, right? Um, and then finally, when there's an eruption on the, and the, the vents kind of settle down on the rift zones, lava starts coming down the hillside, there'll be a lava flow, we'll issue another warning of where lava is likely to intersect people, right? So we can't do it all at once. It's going to come in a series of things. So the first one is just going to be a forecaster, you know, saying that a summit eruption is imminent, right? So if we do that, and you know, Mauna Loa, the other thing that makes it dangerous is it does not give us much more warning. Kilauea is generally much kinder to us than Mauna Loa is, but generally Mauna Loa gives us one, two, three hours, you know, before the eruption starts, and oftentimes it'll move down the rift zones in an equal amount of time. It can move very, very rapidly, as Frank was showing down there. So. So I just want to make sure that you guys understand when you see things that come out, you can tell if it's real or not by, you know, we're not going to forecast anything more initially than a summit eruption. Okay, let me hook this up. And Okay, so the wonderful thing about earthquakes is we can use them to help us forecast volcanic eruptions. The not so wonderful thing about earthquakes is they have a mind of their own and sometimes can cause trouble on their own as well, right? So if you're from California, if you've ever been to California, they have a lot more problems with earthquakes than they do with um, volcanic eruptions, right? So, and you guys here, happen to be in a place where there's plenty of earthquakes, right? And you probably noticed that, um, and particularly on October 14th, we had a magnitude 5 earthquake. Let's see. There we go. Down in this cluster, it's the yellow guy right there. But this is just two weeks of earthquakes in the Pahala area. So Pahala is like right in there. That's where we are right now. Um, Plenty of these earthquakes, the blue ones though, are much, much deeper than the yellow ones. And the blue ones are the ones that have been persistent for the last few years. We, we typically get many hundreds of them a week beneath Pahala. Most of them are less than magnitude three and most are less than magnitude two. Um, I'll talk about what those 
are related to, but the one that caused you problems two weeks ago is different. It's in this yellow colors, which are somewhere between about five and 15 kilometers, which is somewhere on the order of three miles to about 10 miles beneath you. So they're shallower earthquakes. So that means the source of the earthquake, and an earthquake is really just generated when some rock slips or breaks in the earth, and when it does that, it moves, and it creates a vibration that goes through the earth, right? So the, what happens is between the rocks, they store energy. So you can think of it like if you take a stick or a, a yardstick or something and bend it, there's stored energy in that yardstick, right? And I can bend it and bend it and bend it, and then finally, you're gonna to put too much energy into it, it can't hold it anymore, and it's gonna break, and it'll release that energy. And that's what the rocks are doing too. So we never know exactly how much energy a particular set of rocks are gonna store before they break. Um, and it varies, right? So we get little earthquakes, and we get big earthquakes. These guys right in here are related to movement at the base of the volcano. That's the same group of earthquakes right there, plotted on Google Earth. And the white things are faults. So these are mapped faults on the island of Hawaii. You'll notice that you live right inside the biggest nest of faults on the island of Hawaii. And notice that nobody else has it. <laughs> so <laughs> guess where lots of earthquakes are going to happen? <laughs> yeah, much bigger than they look like. Kilauea, which just doesn't look like much on the ground, is really over, it's about 22,000 feet high from the seafloor. And Mauna Loa is pushing the, uh, close to 30,000 feet from the seafloor. So just the weight of these volcanoes causes them to want to slide outward. They can't slide to the north because the other volcanoes are there, the rest of the island, so they can't push that. So what they're doing is these sides of the volcanoes are moving seaward. Kilauea moves just about that way, and Mauna Loa moves this direction, like this. And so the magma inside and the weight of the volcano cause it to move. Well, it's not perfectly smooth, it binds, so it moves and jumps and starts and fits, right? And those are the earthquakes. Each time it takes a movement like that, it kind of jerks, and depending on how much it moves, it's related to how big the earthquake is. So we have lots of little ones, and then we have some big ones. But what you have to remember is the total energy released by an earthquake, we have that nice magnitude scale that I think everybody knows because it's the numbers from one to 10. And like I tell, uh, when I taught it at the university, I tell students it's easy to be a geologist because I can teach you everything with just the numbers between one and 10. Um, <laughs> But hidden inside those numbers, the difference between a magnitude 4 and a magnitude 5, you probably noticed. You've had quite a few 4s here recently, and you had a 5, and it was really different. There's 33 times as much energy released in a magnitude 5 than there is in a 4. It's not just one unit bigger. And to go between 2, so if you went from 4 to 6, it's a 1,000 times. So there's a 1,000 times. It's like the, a 6 is like having a 1,000 4s all at once. So it, there's a lot more energy released on that magnitude scale than it looks like. So the other thing that we're doing right here is here's the summit of Kilauea right here, the summit of Mauna Loa, and the summit of Loihi. And right in between them, in this area right in here, is where the hot spot is coming up from deep inside the earth. And it's trained underneath our island. And those are down at depths that are somewhere around 20 to 40 miles deep. So they're quite deep, and they're in another layer. They're not in the outer crust of the Earth. They're down in what we call the, the mantle, which is outwards. That builds up along with the weight of it, and it slides on that seafloor. But it gets stuck, and then it slides forward and gets stuck. So the magnitude 5 earthquake we had was this movie. And there was a magnitude 4.6 foreshock to that, 24 seconds before the magnitude 5, right? We didn't know it was a foreshock until the magnitude 5 showed up, by the way. So that's the way earthquake stuff works. We don't know until afterwards what to tell you. And the earthquake scientists were all amazed by them because they make lots of money and they're really famous because they tell you what you went through after you went through it, right? <laughs> but everybody that's been through an earthquake likes to say, oh yeah, that was a magnitude 5. Everybody knows that number, right? So they've done a really good PR job on this. 
and made you forget they didn't tell you until afterwards that it was going to be a magnitude 5. But the fact that you had two earthquakes right together in close to the same location caused the shaking to last a lot longer. And that causes a lot more stuff to happen, right? So think of a book on a bookshelf. You shake the bookshelf a little bit, the book maybe moves out an inch. But you keep shaking it. You shake it for 10 seconds, it moves out a little farther. You shake it for 20 seconds, it moves further. You know, and eventually it'll fall off the bookshelf. Same thing with nails in your house. If you take a couple pliers and start bending a nail, you bend it a couple times, it's still okay. But you bend it about 20 or 30 times, and that nail no longer really wants to work like a nail anymore, right? So all of those things depend on the, not just the, the strength of the shaking, but the duration of the shaking as well. So here is the, here are the earthquakes that have taken place. Oops, got the wrong button there. Uh, Mahal is right up in here. And this is the, the area beneath which the, the earthquake actually released. And so there's been about 240 earthquakes from today back to October 14th. Okay, and most of these are what we would classify as aftershocks. And down here is the number. So on October 14th, I think there were around 80 or something in the day. And then they've tapered off, but they're still there. So they decay what we call exponentially. They decay very rapidly in there. So a small earthquake, most of those go away. But right after an earthquake, do, does having more earthquakes help you feel better? No, generally not, right? So the, it, even if they don't do much more damage, they really create a lot of anxiety. But after a big earthquake, like a magnitude 7, the aftershocks can be 5s and 6s. And if you've damaged a building already, then those little earthquakes can actually make the building quite dangerous, right? So, so the, there is a problem with aftershocks on the big earthquakes. They'll, they'll last longer, and if you damage something, you know, then it'll, it'll continue to be a problem. Here is what people reported. And in here, the blues are less than this. This is Pahala right here. This is the, where the earthquake was right here. These are you guys reporting in. So I think some of you guys noticed this and said, hey, stuff fell off my shelves, you know, things broke. You know, rocks fell out of walls, bricks can fall off things, you know, older houses can get damaged, and I hear that some ceiling tiles fell out of places, and some walls get cracked. If you have cinder blocks and you just stack them up with cement, and there's no reinforcement, no steel that runs down through them or anything like that, earthquakes can shake and break those joints between the cinder blocks or bricks or, or rocks, you know, however you have that cemented. And so that commonly falls apart in this. But we have, there's another scale besides the magnitude scale that's called the Mercalli scale. And we report this on our reports after every earthquake. And it's color-coded down here. And so it goes through the same numbers, but in Roman numerals. And I think most of us can read the Roman numerals up to 10, or at least up to 8. When it gets 9 and 10, it gets a little confusing with the X's and stuff. And don't even get me on 40 and 50 and all those. Who knows what that is, but... But still, these things, you can see that the color is down in here below 5 are really not going to cause much damage. Above 5, you start seeing damage, and really at 7 up in here is where you start damaging. 7 and 8 start damaging well-built buildings too, and 9s and 10s will create a lot of damage. So we were in this area, 6 to low 7, right? And so here in Pahala, you had some damage that was relatively significant, right? People really noticed it and it, it caused problems, right? Um, it wasn't enough that it, you know, took you completely offline or anything like that, but it, it still, there was enough damage with these things that caused problems. One of the lines in here when these shake maps come out in here is it has a thing that it says percent of G, or the force of one gra one, um, one unit of gravity, right? So one G is what holds us to the Earth. So when you're held to the Earth, that's the force that you're feeling that's holding you down. So if, what happens if I apply a one G force in the other direction? Yeah, you're going to be weightless, basically. If I do it gently, if I do it really fast, you might bounce, right? So you don't want to be in an earthquake that's applying a 1G force the other direction, okay? 
But the, what you experienced in here was about somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of the gene. So that's enough to really shake things, right? That, that kind of force. It's telling you there's a lot of acceleration, and then each time the wave goes, you're accelerating this way, and then you're accelerating that way, and accelerating this way, and that way, right? So think of your house as a person in the back of a pickup truck that accelerates down the street, hits the brakes, reverses, goes the other direction, hits the brakes, goes the other direction, you know, and goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, right? It's not a pleasant ride for your house, right? So these are the kind of things, why these things cause damage and why you want to have well-built buildings. So we have what people observe, and we create this with the Mercalli scale. We also have these little triangles all over the island, which are accelerometers, which measure that acceleration of the force of gravity. And if you notice, that triangle right in Pahala is lit up in that kind of yellow gold color. So it, that's where we know it was in that 10 to 20% G range. Um, so we can actually measure how hard the ground shook in different places. The other thing that happens around here is you have soil. You're very lucky you have soil because you can plant things and they grow and stuff like that. But you're also very unlucky that you have soil because soil acts kind of like jello in an earthquake. So any place where there's deep soils, it shakes a lot and the vibrations continue after the actual earthquake shaking stops. So think of a bowl full of jello. I shake the bowl, I quit shaking the bowl, bowl isn't moving, but the jello still is, right? And that's what soil does. So having something built on soil makes it more problematic unless you've anchored the foundation all the way down to rock, right? If you're anchored to the rock, then you won't shake with the soil, but if you're just sitting on the soil, you'll shake more. And I think a lot of you guys know how to do this, but if you just go onto the internet and look for did you feel it, you just search for those words, you'll end up on this page. And you look over on the right and there'll be a list of recent earthquakes. You click on the one that has happened to you and then you can fill out a report if you want to say what happened. So we have lots of people, usually after a big earthquake, hundreds of people from around the islands do that. So you can do that too. Um, You've probably heard some people, here's the, the, the figure that Frank had, and so there's the October 14th earthquake, and we've noticed that, you know, the earthquakes beneath the summit of Mauna Loa tapered down, and it appears to be also some of the, the inflation has kind of tapered off in that. But we do know that some Mauna Loa eruptions are preceded by big earthquakes, like magnitude 6 earthquakes. 1984 was the 6.6 .6 earthquake on the Kawiki fault zone up by volcano. So you would have felt that very strongly here, too, because that's on one of those faults that comes straight down to the hollow, pretty much. Um, but not every eruption is preceded by an earthquake, and not every earthquake is related to an eruption. So this earthquake actually seems to, it was further away from the summit. It may have opened up a little space deep within the volcano. It seems to have relieved a little bit of the pressure in the volcano. So we can't tell you when an earthquake is going to be something that precedes an eruption, but if we saw a magnitude 6 plus earthquake either over someplace from Pahala up to Kapapala Ranch and a little bit north by Volcano, or over in the Kialakakua area, those are the two areas where we've had magnitude 6 plus earthquakes preceding eruptions before. And so those would make us, again, wary that there might be an eruption associated with this. So, these are the depths of the earthquakes, and I'm just going to skip over that. That's kind of all the aftershocks we've had. This is magnitude 5 and greater historical earthquakes on Mauna Loa. Guess where you guys are? <laughs> You're kind of in the nest of earthquakes, in the nest of the faults, so not a really big surprise there, right? And these are magnitude 6 and greater. And we're not going to talk about it now, but in 1868, there was a pretty big earthquake over here. And it was a, probably a magnitude 8 earthquake. And it was preceded by a pair of magnitude 7 earthquakes, and probably a week's worth of magnitude 5s and 6s. So it was really quite a thing. And the entire south end of the island, from here all the way over to here, moved. And we think that places on here move many tens of feet. 
at the coastline, right? And there was a 50-foot local tsunami generated at Woodington State Beach Park. Landslides up in Wood Valley that killed people, overran a village, right? So we have the potential to generate really large earthquakes and damaging earthquakes. So it's something to be aware of and just be prepared of, and that's why that's why building codes get changed and things like that, so that, you know, it's one thing if you just live in an old Hawaiian-style house that, you know, is basically doesn't weigh much, so if it fell on you, it wouldn't be that big a deal. But if you live in a new house, you don't want the house falling apart on you, so you want to build them a little bit better. I'm going to just skip that. So, the next thing is these peculiar earthquakes that started in 2019 that sit beneath Mahala and a little bit over to the east of us here. And so we actually have a, a scientist, Nympha Bennington, who's working with another scientist from UH Manoa. And they put out a whole bunch of extra seismometers. So you saw from um, what Frank showed you, our normal instrumentation on Mauna Loa. Well, those are all seismometers down through here and a whole bunch of other seismometers in orange. And they're trying to image these earthquakes that are sitting under Mahalo. So they ran this experiment back in the summertime, so I think June and July. Um, and they just picked up those. So if anybody was involved in that, we thank you very much for your participation in allowing these guys to come onto your land. And we have this set of earthquakes. So here they are. These are these things that are deeper than 20 miles deep in the earth, right? And they form kind of a big flat zone. And we think they're related somehow to the hot spot. And where you have kind of the gooey, kind of silly putty-like part of the interior of the Earth rubbing against the harder, kind of crusty shell of the Earth in there. So there's something going on, and typically these earthquakes have been small. This is just showing how they built up that in uh, 2013, you know, there you got a couple months, nothing going on. Same time period in 2015, a few more show up. And then 2019, they really get going, and then this is this year's bunch of earthquakes in here. So we've had earthquakes like this before, but they kind of were up more towards the, some of the Kilauea, but at around the same depth, so this isn't just the only case of these. Most of these have been less than magnitude 4, and most of them have been less than magnitude 3 and 2. Most of them are quite small. But you probably noticed that you've felt a few more lately. And so these magnitude 4 earthquakes, this is the magnitude 4 earthquakes, and this is just a depth, and this is just a time over in here. So this is starting in August of 2020, August of 2021, and August of 2022. So you can see we're getting more of these magnitude 4 earthquakes. They're all kind of centered over here, a little bit to the east of where we are. We don't know if these are going to get any bigger or not. Um, we don't really understand them very well, quite frankly. I and mean, they appear to be, we're right in the middle, right where the hot spot is coming up, and something's going on down there. But there's been other people that have said, oh, there's going to be a giant volcano that erupts here, or something's going to happen, you know, something terrible. We have no indication of that. Um, they appear to be a flurry of these things. The mantle is moving down at that depth and adjusting. Uh, but what it's doing, we don't really know, and we hope to find out more about it. We don't think they're going to get up. They're not, let's just say this, in order to have a really big earthquake, you have to move a big area, right? And you saw to get the magnitude 8 earthquake, we had to move the whole south half of the island to do that. These are concentrated in a place. I don't think, I mean, it's possible they can get up to 5, but it's, it's hard to believe from the area that they covered that they would get much bigger than that. Okay, so things that you can do is make sure everything that you've got in your house is secured to walls. Um, lots of things you don't think about, like dressers and TVs and stuff like that. Well, the new style TVs are almost all secured to walls, but um, things that kids can pull over on themselves and stuff like that. It's also good to have them secured. And things with glass in them. You don't want your nose dropping on the floor and getting up in the middle of the night and have glass all over your floors. You also want to make sure that if you've got any gas in your house, like for water heaters or stoves, that everything is really secured so you don't break the gas line by having the, the appliance move around. And during an earthquake, it's recommended you drop to the ground uh, on your own before it drops you. 
And then you try to cover particularly your head and your back if you can from damage from things that might fall down on you. And then try to get near something that you can hold on so you don't get bounced along the floor. And have a good plan, right? And have, so a plan would be what you need for volcanic eruptions too. Have a communications plan, a phone number that your whole family can call. You know, if your phones are out and you get to a phone, have some friend that's not in the affected area that everyone can call into and tell them that they're okay. Uh, have a plan of where you might meet up, right? Have all your materials that you need of your house, you know, anything that you own and stuff, have all your important documents in a little bag someplace that you can pick up and take with you. And also have some food and water, right? Because if this is something big, like a really big earthquake, it'll impact the entire island. And there's a good chance that our ports may not be working, we may not be able to get stuff for a while, right? And so we'll be depending on each other, but we may be on our own for a little bit in a big emergency like that. So it never hurts to have those things prepared. So anyway, thank you guys very much. And I'll turn it back to Talmud. districts 
that are encompassed within that area. We work with the different departments um, that we get involved. So we manage the, the alert levels based upon what HVO gives us. Much, as the, much of the information you guys were given today, we, we're looking at that as well. Um, and then we kind of gear our response as to that as well. Um, so along with the alert, alert levels, what we need the community to do, you're, what you can do um, is basically receive our messages. So there's messages at different levels. So messages you can receive that you need to sign up for are our Everbridge messaging. Some of you might get them already, but if not, you guys need to be signed up for that. It's a really good system. Everbridge is our vendor for that. You can actually tailor it to your needs, what you want, the method that you want to receive it. So if you just want to get volcano or earthquake messages or wildland fire messages or high surf messages, flooding messages, you can check those boxes off. If you want to get it in a text or an email or a phone call, you can check those off. I recommend not checking them all off because it's going to drive you crazy. And we're going to get the calls to take you off. So select what you use mostly and go that route. I point to that board there on the side and all those message um, opportunities or options are there. You can sign up or you can use a QR code to access it off your phones or you can take down the links. It's also, if you scrolling, this is our website, Civil Defense webpage on the county website. All that information is on there as well. Um, so that would be the front page of our Civil Defense page. You can go to that section, the volcano hazards for the, the Civil uh, HVO updates, and then you can scroll down for further information. So if you're looking for information, how to prefer, uh, prepare your family plans, business plans, it's all on there as well. Um, so I'll mention now that we're all going to be around what might happen with Mauna Loa. Um, we kind of prepare all year long, definitely from June to November, we're preparing for hurricane season. Every June we have, you know, with the state, coordinated meetings as far as preparation for hurricanes. We have the Hurricane Outlook pushed out from the National Weather Service, and then we bring all the partners together as far as, you know, what kind of response um, everybody's going to have, um, a coordinated response. Anytime the volcano gets into advisory, like I said, we're going to do the same thing. I've been telling people that, that I call it a roller coaster. So back in April of 91, uh, 2021, we were at this heightened level again, and then it dropped off. And now, June of this year, it climbed, September, we're in that same boat where it's, high, it's, it's peaking again. Now it's, it looks like it's stabilizing, but we don't know what, what upturn is going to just keep going to the point that it erupts. So we're going to be doing this again and again, um, making sure that the community is ready for when this eruption happens. You know, as they said, 75 and 84, even though 84 got close to Hilo, minimum impacts, but we fear that, you know, eventually it's going to come into the residential area or a developed area and we're going to have to deal with that. Um, we've, we've experienced Leilani, Lower Puna in 2018. I think a lot of the, the county and the state and federal government have experience with that so we're prepared a lot of what the lessons we learned there will also put to any event that happens with model law so as you see throughout the crowd many of our partner agencies are represented um, hpd the, the kau captain edmondson is here He's learning as much as he can about the situation because for Kau, 
they're going to be the primary responders for the police. Um, fire department, you have the units from Pahala here and, the, and their chiefs as well. Chief Moeller, Chief Provet Provincial, they're on board. They represent uh, you know, the fire department. Also, we have partners, um, non-government partners. So Janice Cater from Vibrant Hawaii, we're working with them closely as they develop their hub system around the island uh, to kind of pick up where the county cannot uh, basically go, basically, you know, just kind of pick up the, the pieces where we cannot uh, um, function. We've also been working with State Emergency Management and FEMA. They get the daily updates. They're interested in, in what Mama Loa is doing as well. Um, lastly, I want to mention the Community Emergency Response Team. I don't think Bahala has a team, but um, they are here with us today, the groups from the Puna teams. And so, and that'll be, CERT is with Civil Defense, so, you know, they're, they're on link into the community as well. Um, I, I guess that's a plug for CERT to actually activate in, in Bahala. It would be nice if we had more teams out here. Um, you know, I know Janice, you spoke in at Ocean View. Do you want to speak again as far as talking about the hub operations? Because if, if we do have an eruption and we organize the hubs, We've, like we've seen in 2018, plays a pretty important uh, role in, in servicing the community and, and uh, you know, kind of helping to, with the recovery. So Janice? Aloha kapo. So Wire in Hawaii has been fortunate to partner with Michelle Galimba and Oka'u Kako. Um, for the past couple of years, we, I think we started off with Keiki Care Packs and we did Kupuna Food Distributions. We had funding from the County of Hawaii through CARES to operate resilience hubs and stood up a hub out at Na'alehu and the Honganji out there. Um, we have partnered with folks from your community who served as digital literacy instructors and handed out um, free laptops to folks. We partnered with folks again who got certified in mental health first aid and then provided those workshops. Um, and now continuing on with our resilience hubs. Here in Pahala, our contact is Julia Neal out in Ka'u, continues to be with the uh, Marsha Masters and the Honganji out there. We've recently partnered with David Anitak and his wife Lucinda in the Ocean View Marshallese community and um, always welcoming more folks to come in and be a part of the network. And the idea of Resilience Hubs is really centered around asset-based community development and ask the question, what can we do on our own? And really, what can we do to build resilience within communities so that whenever there is an event, that communities are not as deeply impacted as they would be had we not made that investment, not only in training and resources, but really in relationships and building trust and communication within each other and across communities. And so the value of this network now that has grown to over 40 hubs around the entire island is really embedded in the native intelligence through this olelo no eao that tells us hili na ipuna kalaleya pa'u and the way that communities operated on our islands where we were able to, because of relationships with neighboring communities, come to rely on one another. When one community is deeply impacted, you have the relationships and resources available to be able to share and to be able to support one another. And that's really the, the, the goal of our network of hubs. Um, I wanted to share with you coming up, we are again supporting um, the network of hubs in Kau. They are coming together in collaboration to put on an event during the season of Makahiki. So many folks associate Makahiki with traditional games of skill. We are delving into another aspect of Makahiki which had to do with data analysis and strategic planning. And um, 
we know from the stories and traditions of Makahiki that that was a very important aspect that was held during this time. It was a time to bring forth your data, your goods, your evidence of what you created and contributed and what your expertise was. And from that, the community would do an analysis on all this evidence of data being brought forth and strategically plan for the next year based on the resources that they were seeing. Um, and so similarly, our hubs are doing that, coming together. Their event is being planned for Saturday, December 3rd. Um, they have some really amazing plans coming forward. In addition, Vibrant Hawaii as an administrative team will be there. We are investing and partnering with local businesses to be able to provide emergency buckets um, as a starter for folks who may not have one yet. And um, it's a really great opportunity, again, not to only build awareness of resources and how to increase resilience, but investing in the relationships and friendships and trust within and across communities. So I hope you will join us there. And I'd like to um, ask Michelle, is there anything that you'd like to add? Um, no, there really isn't. But yeah, please come down to the hub in Nalehu on December 3rd going to be, I believe, 10 to 2, but there'll be flyers out soon. And last, I'd like to introduce one of the things that we deeply invest in within our network of hubs is reaching out to partners within communities who have an expertise in a certain area. And so I'd like to acknowledge um, Philip Ong and Dane DuPont from Hawaii Tracker, who have come on to support our network of hubs. They are currently going out to our hub sites around the island and conducting a communication, evaluation, and assessment. Um, from that assessment, they will then work with hubs to help develop a communication plan, both on the, the human skills and certifications and things that they would recommend, as well as the built infrastructure which then again helps to inform Vibrant Hawaii of how to make investments in specific areas in targeted ways. So I'd like to acknowledge and thank them. And if you have a chance to talk story with them, um, I encourage you to do so. Mahalo. Mahalo, Janice. We share this information with you guys because it's, it's important. You know, if we've got to respond to an emergency you need that information as to what resources are out there for you. So the hub serves a pretty critical uh, resource as well as you know what we would put together as far as a disaster information center uh, and, and provide our case management and so forth. So some things that came up during the Ocean View uh, meeting that I kind of wanted to reflect on and, and actually give me an opportunity to also um, call out Parks and Recreation, uh, Director Maurice Messia. Messina is here, but we do work closely with them as far, and they've been active big time already, you know, knowing it's hurricane season, but specifically for Mauna Loa, they've been working to designate what shelters would be activated if we need them, where, and so forth, recognizing that a flow there's two sides to a flow, so they know that they would have to probably open up two shelters. They work closely with American Red Cross in planning that out. And so, you know, depending, like I said, within that 51% of the island, where the flows go, we, I am assured that we'll have shelter for people. In 2018, people ended up going to friends and neighbors or friends and families. Um, hotels, they went back to the mainland, and a lot of folks, I forget the exact number, but stayed in our shelters. And that shelter was activated for months. Our, so, our Parks and Recreation has so much experience, uh, probably the best in the state at running the shelters, and I've been to their meetings, and, and they'll give the, you know, the people that go to the shelters the best, uh, best experience that they can. Uh, we, we fed them entertainment, uh, and they're all pet friendly as well. So, you know, that was a big thing during, the, during that eruption. The last thing I want to mention, insurance coverage, you gotta talk to your broker. If you have insurance, you gotta talk to your broker as to what coverage you have. Um, and, you know, 
to see what you can work out. But, uh, that, you know, that's the best advice I can give from the government. So as far as uh, any other comments, we'll move into the question and answer phase. So what we're going to have here is we've got that mic there. You guys can come up to the mic if you've got a question. If you can't come up to the mic, we've got a portable mic that we'll, we'll bring to you. Um, so I hope somebody's getting started here. And you can call out whoever, uh, whether it's the scientists, civil defense, or any of the other departments that are here. We're here to answer your questions. You need a mic? about hot spots and siren there on uh, Kamal Road right by the base, base yard right there. When that siren goes off, there's no cell service after that. You can text, but you cannot call anybody at all. It's all you get is a busy signal. Is that related to anything that you can share with us here this evening? Well, we know in past emergencies, uh, because of the use of cell, that it just becomes inundated to where you just get the busy signal. And so, what you found is the result, you just text. And, and we ask people, if you don't have an emergency, stay off the phone. Um, yeah, we, we've seen that in a number of uh, emergencies. What the government has done, we actually work with the cell providers so that we can function. We have lines that we can utilize but still yet, for the, the citizens and so forth, if you don't have an emergency, stay off the cell phone so that people that do have an emergency, got to call 911 or whatever, they can, they can have that access. Okay, thank so, you for your answer. Good question, thank you. Thank you. Do you have a plan in place as far as exodus besides the main highway? Uh, any roads? that you're going to be opening or uh, any other plans like that so that it's just not a mass <laughs> on the one two lane highway? Well, what you see is what we have as far as road, roadways. And like I said, Mauna Loa covers 51% of the island to account for all those areas and, and you know, start to improve everything. It's a huge undertaking and the county won't do that because we don't know where it's going to go. So, with what you're saying, and what you've heard here today, is we hope to have the most lead time that we can, that we can get people out of harm's way, you know, before, way before any life-threatening hazard is there. And so, 
Right, if there's bottlenecks, that might happen, but we'll get you out of there before, we, before the, the, the threat to life and safety exists. And that's why we went to Ocean View, because they're in that situation. Like you were told, it's, it's days before any flow could get down to this region, weeks, maybe even months in other areas. So we recognize, you know, the, the traffic congestion, because we look at that with every disaster, tsunami, hurricanes, and so forth. And so we just try to get the information as fast as we can so we can take our actions. Yeah, and I'll just add too that, you know, unlike something like if you're in the tsunami zone, where that whole zone is gonna be inundated, or if there's a hurricane, where you know there's no real escape of this. If if you looked at the maps that Frank was showing, the lava flows actually impact a fairly small part of Mauna Loa, right? So now, if you're unlucky enough to be in that small part, it has a huge impact on you. I understand that, but it also means there's a lot of places to move, right? And the lava flows themselves are generally traveling at 10 miles an hour or less. So you can get out of the way. Um, you know, there, it, there's always the potential in a worst case scenario that the road was backed up and some people may have to leave their cars or something. That would be the absolute worst case scenario. And hopefully we can avoid that. And we're trying to work our best to let civil defense know where the lava flows are coming. So it gives the residents the appropriate information. Do I turn to the right when I hit the highway? Do I turn to the left when I hit the highway, right? That's what you really want to know. But we can't do that until we react to what the volcano is doing, right? So we will be really vigilant and try and get civil defense the information as early as possible to get it to you guys so that you know the appropriate actions to take and so they also know where they can open up shelters and things. But it, there's a lot of different possibilities out there, so it's really hard for Talmadge to say, right now we're going to do this, this, and this. They have to plan for everything, and that's what they're doing. And you know, so we will work. And you know, it's really good that you guys take the initiative to come out here to be aware of what the scope of the issue is, so that when it does happen, you'll understand it's going to unfold pretty quickly. If you live in Ocean View, it could unfold quickly. You may miss it completely, though. There, there's only been one lava flow or two lava flows that have really gone through there. A lot of other lava flows have missed it, right? So you just never know. Can you go to the mic? Everybody wants to hear a question. So what if we're on the highway and you guys tell us to evacuate? When we start going, say, towards Kona, you say, go that way, it's, don't come this side, South Point. So what happens if a fissure opens up on the only road we have? And then, you know, we're backed up, we got all these people there, yeah? And then all of a sudden, it broke on that end. What happens? Okay, just, so, so now we're going down into si situations that, right? no, no. Let, let, let the geologists tell you how things are going to happen. Well, I mean, the, the good news is that, the bad news is Mauna Loa is big and it does things really fast, right? The good news is it's pretty predictable and in your face about what it's going to do, right? It's going to start at the summit and if it moves down a rift zone, it's basically going to open that rift zone in sequence. So you don't have to worry about it jumping back to here and then jumping down to there. It goes down towards the lowest point. Yeah. Well, the rift zone only crosses the road in one place, and that's way over in, uh, you know, towards South Point. And that only opened up um, during, or about a week after the magnitude 8 earthquake that happened down here. And that was because the earthquake pulled that older part down. So that part does not open very frequently. The part of the rift zone that opens frequently is going to terminate up high above Hawaiian Ocean View Estates up in there. So it's not going to come down and crack across the highway or anything like that. So it's basically, it's going to stay up there and it's going to pour lava flows down. And those lava flows then have the potential to cut the road.
Um, generally, that slows it down because there's a lot of massive cold rock and it starts to congeal. If lava gets into a lava tube, it generally doesn't travel very far and it slows it way down. So, so don't think of it like, oh, the lava decided to take the subway, so it's going to jump in the tube and show up over here. <laughs> you know, that's so, you know, like I said, you're, you're going to see it coming. It's going to be out there on the surface and it's going to be coming and you can just step out of its way if the worst comes to worse, you know. But that's preferably not where we're at, but, you know, we want to make sure that we can track it, give civil defense the information so they can tell police and fire, to make sure the information that people, gets to people as they're leaving their houses and stuff, right? Yeah, following up, adding a little bit more to that. When the activity starts, we'll have police, fire, public works, all on the ground. So, you know, we, we kind of monitor where everything's are breaking out and make sure that people aren't driving the wrong way and so forth. Yes, sir. I want to get away from the disaster at hand and go back to the guys who do the research. We've got a hot spot underneath us. And there's an island that's coming off down to the south, uh, east of us or so. Is there any relation between the hot spot, and I've noticed there's been a lot of little earthquakes going off out in the ocean. Is, is, does anybody have any idea that maybe the island is moving away and will soon be like uh, Kauai and Oahu and there won't be any more lava here? Well, how long do you have to wait? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, Loihi, um, you know, Kamehua Kanaloa, the new name for Loihi, the seamount to the south of us, is feeding off the hotspot just like Mauna Loa and Kilauea are, right? So lava feeds into all three of those volcanoes. The earthquakes in Loihi are not unlike the earthquakes we see in Kilauea and Mauna Loa. They're representative of magma getting up shallow beneath the structure. So they're all feeding off of that. And yes, the island moves. It moves about that much every year to the northwest, right? And so if you've got a little spare time, like to get to where Kauai is, it's a five million year trip if you're riding the big island, right? So it takes a long time, right? And so five million years is when our very earliest ancestors of early humans showed up on Earth, right? So it's, it's a bit of time there, so you don't have to worry about that. Do we know what the behavior of the Pahala earthquake swarm area was before the two previous eruptions? We can look back at those earthquakes back to about 1960 or so. And there have been a few little smatterings of activity there, but there's nothing that approaches the activity that we're seeing now. Right? In the 70s, there was more of this kind of, like I said, a little bit to the north and east between the summit of Kilauea and where the current thing is. So there's been earthquakes in a similar area, um, and these may or may not be connected with those, but they're in about the right depth and about the right planar configuration to be part of that. I have two questions. The first one is really quick. Um, is there any advantage to having a landline instead of a cell, or and a cell? Well, we always like to think of redundancy as something good, and so um, you know you don't have, you don't have to charge your landline; it's just plugged in. So yeah, okay. well, that's why we put we push messages out so that landlines can actually receive verbal messages. I had a friend in Houston whose, whose family had a landline and everybody in their neighborhood could come to their house because everybody else didn't have a landline and they had, they, they were able to help people get in touch and I, so I always think, I, I think, is it a fallacy or not <laughs> that having a landline is a, a, a good thing? Yeah, absolutely. It is. For that, for that matter, it, that's what other people, some people prefer, you know, some generations, and we recognize that. So we make sure that our messages 
go to landlines as well. But um, I, what I'm asking is, is it, do you have a better chance of having it be effective as a uh, uh, communication tool? It, right, because it's not affected by the, the signal going through okay. the cell tower. So, so yeah. the answer is yes. All right. My second question is, um, when I was in the seventh grade, I experienced the Great Alaska Earthquake. Um, which uh, I watched out the window of my school, telephone poles going like this. And I watched cars falling into craters. And I, you know, I mean, we watched buildings split. <laughs> I mean, the, the carnage from that was just incredible. But I'm just, what my question is, if, you, uh, does our, um, Earth, dirt, uh, soil have the same kind of potential to create that the, the, the trees bending down to the ground, the telephone poles going back and forth, and you know, is that the same kind of thing that can Because you were in Anchorage, is that right? No, I was in Palmer. Okay, which, so that's it was close a, by, yeah. Well, it's equidistant, the, the yeah. center was right between. Yeah, and you're on a lot of loose sediment there, and so there were a lot of landslides, so the earthquake triggered a lot of landslides, and, and you had, <laughs> yeah, and that sediment is very thick, so what can happen in that, if you've ever thrown rocks in a bucket, and you can throw them, you can watch, and you can watch this at the ocean too, when a wave bounces off something, it can either cancel out an incoming wave, or it can go together and strengthen it to make kind of a super wave. So those kind of things happen in those sedimentary basins too, where you get big standing waves and stuff that just shake everything apart. And no, we're not in that situation per se. So. I, I it just triggered, you know, child now, memories. <laughs> <laughs> we can get earthquakes that are pretty strong, and there were descriptions from the 1868 earthquake of palm trees bending over and almost touching the ground just from the actual shaking of the earthquake. So, you know, we can get very strong shaking. It's potential here. So, yes. But not the <laughs> continuous and not the whole earth falling apart and tearing the... Well, know, it was uh, eight minutes. It was eight, eight, eight minutes, nine point. It was a magnitude nine. Yeah. yeah. So it was really good. Hi, I have two questions. Um, in February of 1994, you guys published two columns in Volcano Watch talking about the hazards of Post and Pier Foundations. And in one of those, you had a diagram that basically told people to add six little walls around the base of their house attached to the foundation. Now, I know building codes have changed over time, but I wanted to know, is that still advisable for all Post and Pier um, buildings, or is that just for older buildings? Well, if you have a post and pier that's not attached, that's just floating on cinder blocks or tofu blocks, right? Um, you want to get it attached to the ground because if it falls off of those blocks, then it can warp the building and cause a lot of damage, right? So that those designs that were published back then were for a perfectly square house. And what they were do is to lay a little cement foot wall there in the corners that you could tie your your house to the ground. What I would recommend is you work with an architect if you want to retrofit because most houses aren't perfect squares and things like that. There's a lot of stuff. So work with an architect that can help you build these shear walls, that's what they're called. And then you can retrofit older buildings that way. Okay. And when you say older buildings, um, so if something was built say 2000 and beyond, would you still need to do it? I, I'm trying to figure out the definition of older buildings. Um, most of the, like the plantation style houses are the ones that are mostly floating on the you know on their blocks, right? Um, most of the new buildings you can kind of see if you go out and look at the porch and stuff. There should be big angle irons holding the your um, support beams and stuff down. So, and one thing that's important to realize though is you might think that oh, with the hurricane stuff we put hurricane ties throughout our whole building, but hurricane ties are made to keep the force of lifting your roof off so they're made to, to resist the pulling force, right? So hurricane ties, if you wiggle them back and forth, they're made out of pretty thin metal, and an earthquake will wiggle them back and forth, and so you need a different kind of 
of system to make your house more earthquake resistant bolts and things like that that don't move. So you, it's best to work with an architect if you want to retrofit a house. My second question is we have a lot of farmers here in Kau, um, and this is kind of related to Deborah's question before. If a big earthquake happens and we happen to be up at our farms, is our landslide something that we should watch out for? Landslides are things where you have steep walled valleys and you guys happen to live in the one place on the island that has steep walled valleys all around the Ninole Hills, right? So you definitely want to beware if you're near one of those valleys and there's a fair amount of stuff that can liquefy and make mud and that's what happened in Wood Valley in 1868 that you basically shook enough of this wet soil that it came down and it slid and it made kind of like a flow of mud that went through the village. So yeah, if you're out on just the flat plateaus and out in the big field or down, you know, here in, in the MacNet orchards and that kind of stuff, it's not, you're not going to be worried about. It. And that kind of landslide you're talking about, that was with an 8.0. Is that something that would happen with like a 6 or no? Um, you know, like the magnitude 6.7 earthquake that happened in 2006 shook a lot of stuff loose in Waipio Valley and Kealakekua Bay and stuff, so pieces of things did fall off, so there were landslides associated with those. So it just depends on how close to falling the rock is already, right? Thank you so much. Again, uh, you said rift. Well, I'm talking about caves. There's a lot of caves that go under kaboom. So the lava tubes, yeah. Yeah, so there's, so are you guys also watching all those things under me? Because there's a lot of caves that go under kaboom. Well, like I was telling other people, lava to get into those lava tubes is pretty much going to have to flow into an old skylight. No, we, we can't monitor every lava tube, and, and things aren't going to just pop up, right? It'll be a lava flow that comes, and the kind of lava flows that come down Mauna Loa are, tend to be pretty sticky, unless we have a long-term eruption. The Pohoihoi is from Mauna Loa eruptions that last for many months. Um, so what generally happens is if you put lava into one of those lava tubes, the, all the rock is quite cold. Right? And so what it does is it makes that lava even stickier and it blocks it up. So typically the most we've seen lava move in a lava tube is maybe a quarter of a mile or a half a mile before it plugs it up and then it can't go through it. So you don't have to worry about it sneaking around in those old lava tubes. <laughs> I'm with you on that. <laughs> yeah, so, and it, you brought up a good point though, in the 1975 earthquake, which was a magnitude 7.6, 7.7, something like that, the coast moved out, you know, where the Boy Scouts were at Holope, the coast moved about 15 feet seaward and dropped about 10 feet. So there was a local tsunami about 20 feet high, but the ground surface also dropped. So it's, if you feel a strong earthquake, you want to get away from the coast as fast as you can. Well, and we were in that one, and it was down into the loop, and it didn't come from up, it came from under up. So that's why I thought it was kind of interesting that you guys were watching all of the things that happened. Well, yeah, so what that would generally do is those earthquakes are generated that the ocean is pushed away at first, and then it's going to come back up and fill up again and come back to a higher level. So 
you know, normally most of our tsunami generating things are going to make the ocean go out first and then come back in. Thank you for coming here for us. Uh, I was uh, wondering if there's any consideration that all the swarming and activity in this vicinity could possibly, uh, that uh, if there's a lot of magma underneath, that it could create the next Kilauea here? <laughs> we don't think there's any chance of that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so it, it, is, it is something that is of great interest in how hotspots work and how magma is transferred to the three active volcanoes that are drawing off of it. But, it, and it also, if you want to talk, I can tell you all sorts of mysterious things about how the world works or how we don't understand it works later. But there's a lot of things about how the plates move that we don't fundamentally understand and it may be telling us something about that too, so. We live in not a land here and we've been feeling pretty safe, but now we're not feeling so safe. So, uh, what, are, what are our chances in not a land? <laughs> No, I mean, just because Frank is the person that did the mapping and he can give yes. you the ages of the lava flows exactly. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> As long as you have the experts, might as well hear it straight from the experts. Thank you. <laughs> okay, you familiar with the lava lava flow hazard zone map? Yep. Naleo is in zone six? Yep. Okay, so it's based on how frequently the areas get covered by lava flows. Mm. And because in, in Naleo, Waiohinu, the lava flows are really old. So you're starting to look at, as you come up the highway from uh, Whittington Beach Park. Yes. As soon as you start rising up the rise there, those flows are between 5, 10, 15, 20,000 years old. Okay. okay, if you go if you go the other direction, if you start at Whittington Park and you drive towards like Punalu, then you got 2,500 years old, 2,200 oh, years old. Okay. And then you get to Kawa, which is the youngest flow on that side, which is about 700 years old. Oh, wow. Okay, so big difference when you go that way versus the other way. Okay. And so I'm not going to say lava's not coming to your area, but I'm saying that in the past it shows that your area gets has had less coverage than other areas. Thank you. <laughs> Could you explain to us, during the flow, does the lava melt the old rock that's there, or does it just push it aside? Now, these lava flows aren't hot enough to melt the old rock as the whole flow. Occasionally in lava tubes, we see the, the lava tube after many weeks or months will start to melt down a little bit, but only about 10, 20 feet, something like that. But a normal lava flow just flows over the surface. And if there's some loose stuff, it might kind of bulldoze that up and incorporate it in it. But for the most part, these flows are gonna come down and just roll over the surface. Pahoehoe rolls very passively over its surface. Uh-uh, if there's something there that isn't tied down well, like trees, houses, whatever, we'll just knock it down, right? There's a lot more force in an uh, -uh flow, but there's no, it's not gonna dig its way down. And the one thing they tend to do is come down low areas, and that's what Frank's lava inundation zones are, kind of low areas like watersheds. And what they do after they come down, they turn a valley into a ridge. So that'll change how the next lava flow comes down. So that's one of the things that makes it a little tricky when we're in the middle of an eruption. So with, with the 1984 that came down in ocean, uh, I think it was 84, um, the ones that came on each side of Hawaiian ocean, you would have to be different. So those, those now will be the Lava, 
Yeah, I'll repeat it. So the question was, the, it's the 1907 lava flows that kind of at the top of Hawaiian Ocean View Estates make a V like this. And I'll let Frank answer that because he's more familiar with the topography up there, whether they're going to offer any protection. Uh, Frank, <laughs> Frank ran away. <laughs> um, Who's asking? Oh. At the top of the subdivision, you're actually still in zone one. And so that means you can have a big wall, but if the lava comes up underneath the wall, you've got no protection. So the short answer is if you live high on the subdivision, it's not going to happen now. If there's a, an eruption above you, then the 1907 can offer some protection by the collecting the lava flow. But the topography in there, and I've been in there and I've done some, some profiles across the lava flow, there are some areas in which it will act as a diversionary structure and some areas where it doesn't offer enough relief and a new flow can just over top it and continue along its way and get within the center and then threaten the houses in the, between the ports. Uh, first question for civil defense, I'd say, is um, if this thing comes in the middle of the night, I know for calling the tsunamis or whatever, there was a police evacuation or evacuation areas. So they came like down the neighborhood with sirens. If this thing comes in the middle of the night to an evacuated area of UD, will we have a uh, this in Kau, like the police sirens in the middle of the night and whatnot? I'd say yes. Pretty much, you know, what we did in 2018 when we evacuated Leilani, Kapo, and so forth. Um, for this one, working with HBO, we hope to get warning way ahead of time so that we're not evacuating people in the middle of the night. And we actually, that's one of our decisions that we make. If, if they're telling us that things are imminent and it's headed in this direction and we see nightfall coming, we might pull the trigger and evacuate that community before that period because it's, it's dangerous basically evacuating yeah. at night. So, you know, that's, that's one of the decisions we have to make. But um, as far as on the ground, yeah, police, They'll be supported by all the other districts, you know, all, all the you know, folks that are on, on duty at that time, and they'll probably call back other officers, um, many other departments, public works, and so forth, you know, will have in the communities doing evacuation as well. So me and Auntie were wondering, because we missed the Ocean View meeting, and um, if the directions are different for that district in here because of the short time notice and the people. To be there in a few hours or less. Yeah. Right, and, and so you know that's that's the reason we went to Ocean View to let them know that things could be fast over there. But you know, the situation could be the same here where the flow is coming down, not as fast, but we can kind of forecast when, when things would be happening. And that's why all those items highlighted in the dark blue, that's critical for you to get our messages, and that's the other way that messaging will be coming out. And then second question, maybe for the geologists, would be, um, say we get an earthquake that is a bad one, you know, very bad, maybe above five, above six, seven, something that's pretty hard to stand, whatnot. Um, and we're in the Kau district. If we don't hear a siren or know exactly the point, if we're off grid or whatnot, do we go up because of a tsunami risk? Or, because if we go up to evacuate and there could be an earthquake, because that could also be triggered from uh, or a volcano from an earthquake, right? So it's like, do you go up, do you go down? Which is the best place to evacuate in a heavy earthquake? Okay, so... Maybe even an eight or I, I might, I might <laughs> give a, a different perspective than my boss, but if you're down by the ocean and there's a big enough earthquake and you cannot stand, then you run inland, right? Get away from the ocean. Now, if you got a big earthquake and you start running inland and you look like this and you see bright red glow, 
and smoke, then you might think of a different direction to go. And then it goes on. Um, but if you're down by the ocean, no matter if you get go over there, if it's a big earthquake, still run and land because the tsunami will get you before the lava flow. You can have time. Yeah. The tsunami will be there. Really if, it's, if, it, if it's real, real like you cannot stand or like 10 seconds or longer, you also should be aware of it. Well, it's if, it, if, it's, if it's like a rolling shaking, but if it's a violent one where you cannot stand, then it's very local and the inundation time is less than 15 minutes, especially in Kalu. Now, if you're on the other side, the Kona side, it might be a little bit longer, but either way, this Aikele, it doesn't matter if it's a duration or you cannot stand. If you think it's big enough, go in that. The same thing if we're living on the side of our, mount, our mountain over here, the Kalu side, and we, we get a bad one. We're living at a thousand to what, four or five thousand feet elevation. What do we do? It's a bad one. Yeah. Well, it could be the volcano. Then, could then, be yeah, the but what I would worry about, if you got a bad one, you can worry about you and your Ohana person and check to make sure everything's safe. Your gas lines haven't been blown out and you can burn down your house. And then, and then after that, you can just look skyward to see if the volcano is doing anything. But if, you, if you're 100 feet above the ocean, then you're pretty much safe from a tsunami. What about the, what about the volcano if we're living on the side of the mountain? It rumbles really bad and we don't get a notification. Well, like to say, the first things first. Take what care. About the mountain? Take, <laughs> no, no, take care of your family and yeah, make sure yeah, everybody's yeah. safe. Make sure that. Place isn't going to burn down because of damage. Take care of that stuff, and then start waiting for if you get notification. If you think it's a volcano, then just look up the mountain. Yeah. And see. Yeah. Thank you for yeah. Hi. So um, I teach at Kavoy Elementary School, and so I experienced the 2018 lava uh, eruption you know, there in Leilani SD. Um, and at that time, and I know you folks said that um, right now there are like 61 earthquakes today, you think it was, or sometimes like a day. But at that time, it was like a thousand earthquakes, whether they felt it or not, it was like a thousand a day. Is that like the um, norm or like the expectation or like is there a pattern? Well, let's just hope that Leilani isn't the norm. <laughs> that would be bad. But, but the, what it was doing was draining a shallow magma chamber that was sitting underneath the summit of Kilauea. So as that magma left, the block of rock on top of it, a void would open up, and then it would be shaking, shaking, kind of going loose, and then it would drop into that void. And then lava continues to drain out of it, and it repeats that process. And so you just do that over and over again. And so that block is just sitting there shaking, making lots and lots of earthquakes till it finally drops and then starts over again, you know, as the lava drains out. Because the lava was draining out at a pretty consistent rate. So that is something that, you know, this is the first time that that has been really recorded in a big scale like that. So hopefully it's not very common. Yeah, it was, it was really scary. It was like earthquakes every other minute. <laughs> yes. So yeah, if you lived up in Volcano, it was very unsettling. And you guys down here in Pahala probably felt a lot of them too, because it was like a magnitude five every day. And then lots and lots of smaller earthquakes, like many thousands of smaller earthquakes. My next question is, um, I don't know if I read it in a part, or I heard it, or it was on the news, but um, you folks, are already tracking the magma and the magma is already collecting in one pool somewhere on the southwest ridge or rift. <laughs> well, I think Frank correct? showed you what we know tonight. That we know that magma has been injecting into the summit area, right? Down at a depth of around three kilometers, which is on the order of two miles down below the surface. And so that magma has been expanding down there, and it accelerated in the amount of pulsive magma kind of accelerated in mid-September. And as he said, we're not seeing anything down either one of the rift zones. 
Okay, and we don't know what, even if we saw something down the rift zone, if that would that mean anything about that that was a likely place for an eruption to take place at this point. We just don't have enough past information to make a forecast based on that. And then, um, do you folks have a map that shows the lowest, because um, the lava will flow in that lowest point, right? Right, it'll follow a path in the lowest point. Do you folks have a map or a topography map showing that? There's a guy who made it. Okay, so one of the things that we have not talked about today, and you saw probably in Pahoa in 2014-15 and during the 2018, is those blue lines that we call the lava flow paths, the steepest lines of descent. Yes, they do exist, we have them. We also have, when an outbreak occurs, and we know that location, then we can simulate a lava flow and run models from that point to give us a forecast of where it anticipates. And it integrates topography. Mm -hmm. And now we got more sophisticated models that takes physics and cooling and the magma properties. But those are things that we have in our toolbox, yeah, but in case. in case. That's right. So if you go online, you can get those blue lines, the steepest descent lines. Those are online. We have a publication. You look on our website, you can get it from there. But, you okay. would, but we wouldn't know where it would flow until it actually erupts. Until it erupts, we okay. cannot say. Because just like I said, we don't know if the rift zones are going to be involved until we see the earthquakes migrate. And then we say, oh, it looks probable, but then we got to wait for the outbreak. And I just want to say, I do respect the Kukuna's question earlier, because nobody expected the lava to come out in the Lani Estates. Yes? No. Yeah. We, we expected it to come oh, out there, or we <laughs> did yes. I, I'm saying I disagree. We expected it to come out there. Because it did, didn't it go through lava tubes or like, no it, no, it followed a dike, so we could watch the propagation of earthquakes. Mm -hmm. They started under Leilani, and then the fissures opened up above to where earthquakes occurred. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Good evening. I recently moved to the island, I moved to the island, so um, I'm a mother of eight year old. My question is, um, will civil defense evacuate children in the school in case of an earthquake well, without parents, before parents' arrival. Um, um, my son goes to Nolanto, so if it's a big quake and there's asking anyone, uh, it takes me 25 minutes to get to school. So what would be the response? To evacuate to schools? To evacuate schools or kids at school. So I, I know the DOE has, and each school practices their evacuations for various reasons. I'd say the situation you're talking about would be very rare that we would order an evacuation um, in a community to affect the school. Um, related to what we're talking about today, I'd say it would never happen. We would take action long before that, that situation would come around to the point where we, they, they would know school wouldn't open that day, right? right? So we're projecting far ahead of time because we, we realize the impact to the families, the parents who have, have to drop off the kids, go to work, um, you know, dealing with daycare and so forth. So we take all that into consideration. Okay, so there would be one provide ahead of time for definitely definitely and that's i point again to that board you got to receive our messages to know what's going on thank you and i want to say that i've been listening to the tax study back back tax to go and everything and having, um i think i've gone ahead with that and i want to be the best possible incorporate any great instruction for people everything thank oh, you thank, thank you so that will be the last question for tonight. We will be around for a little while more. Um,
to address any questions you guys got. But uh, I really appreciate your time coming tonight and your interest. And, you know, really applaud you guys. Uh, you guys are here. Thank you. Alright, how's that? <laughs> There's better? Dane's All right. talking to the police over here. Alright, let me get the chat up there. Ooh, we're back. Okay. <laughs> well, that was a good meeting. Yeah. What'd you pick up from it? Yeah, they covered a lot of ground. I was really happy to see if they talked about earthquakes a lot more today. Yeah. That was my main um, back last night. I was talking about earthquakes more. It's much more like a lava flow. Right. I talked about that all in the last stream, so I'm going to see if that's... Yeah. That's the first thing you can answer. Questions, people express their questions with the microphone, mm -hmm. and answers. Absolutely. We saw the whole range of technology based yeah. rights, we don't know anything at all, mm -hmm. and others have been this before. Very good questions this evening, too. Yeah, really good. I think the overall theme, again, is just be aware, be prepared, know your exit routes. Know that know that all of us only have a right or a left turn. Yeah, that we one can go. highway the whole, throughout the whole highway. So the right. the chat that I had earlier with somebody <clears throat> was more than HVO or USGS or, or civil defense. Help your neighbor mm -hmm. here, because they may not be the ones that can get out as fast as you. So it's better to grab them and go and help out the people next door to you then wait for somebody to come and get you right right ground up right what we're doing is that we're going to be the first ones there mm -hmm. to respond eventually Tanya will come in eventually Steve will come in that's big enough that's a command and then mm -hmm. that's okay Steve will leave Tanya will leave and it's back in the community so it always starts and it's a community always yeah. so that's where you're going to Mm -hmm. Now we, we did get a question the other day that the hub is across the street from the high school in Pahoa, right? And there's no hub established yet for Ocean View, right? Because, like uh, they were saying, where can we put it? Because the lava could go anywhere. So we really can't really pre-plan that. Would that be right? Did I miss that? Well, so the, the thing that Hawaii is doing is, is building a resilience hub's capacity everywhere. That includes designating buildings that are physical structures that are in place. Mm -hmm. uh, that's still being rolled out. So there is uh, at least one group of ocean view that's working on that. Good. Okay. We're collaborating with them on that. Exactly. You know what that's progress. We have some time to you know, um, It's good to start these conversations and light a fire under everyone's butt so we can get this process going. That should have happened. <laughs> Years ago. Yeah. We should have prepared all this whole the last two decades. Yes. What has been with magma for two decades already, right? right? So I think what's different now? Yeah. What's, what's Can't different turn is the mic. That we want to prepare ourselves. We're good. Yeah. Can you pass me that bottle of off right there? <clears throat> there's plenty of stuff. There's no more though. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Cover up the name. <laughs> <laughs> the passing out uh, an emergency so you don't get dengue over here or malaria. Hey, hey, it's a concern. Okay. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, it was a good event tonight. Um, if you have any questions, you know how to reach us. Phil and Dane will be back next or week. Or leave it in the comments below. Leave in the, the comments. Stream. There you go. Phil and Dane will be next week. You guys will be back up tentatively from what Dane said last night. Uh, I'm going to confirm Thursday now because okay. the meeting is going to be on a Saturday. Okay. Yeah, so they'll be back up next week. 
And uh, send your comments in the comments below. Go on to our 24-7 live stream. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. We're Two Pineapples, Lou and Anna. There's Philip on the geologist. Dane's down there chit-chatting. Mahalo, everybody. Aloha. Have a good night.